Okay, so I want to welcome you all to our program today um, on behalf of the Goldstone Caregiver Center and the Faith Community Nurse Program. Um, I'd like to welcome you to Planning for the Inevitable, Demystifying the Funeral Process, and it's being presented by Tanya Porta today. Tanya is a Connecticut licensed funeral director and embalmer. She is the current owner of the Cornell Memorial and Brookfield Funeral Homes, a family-owned funeral home for more than a century. Tanya is passionate about educating the community about planning for final services. Thinking and talking about funerals and death is often an avoided topic. Tanya provides a relaxed, open conversation to help overcome some of the fears one might have. She's found that most people fear the unknown about making funeral choices, and by answering their questions, many feel relief in having that knowledge. The purpose of this workshop today is to provide community support and education. You will not be asked to provide your contact information for future solicitation. Tanya is proud that our community is filled with professional funeral directors who serve our neighbors extremely well. Um, a couple of things before I turn it over to Tanya about the Zoom. If everyone can please put yourselves on mute, that will be great. Um, Tanya is going to be speaking, so if you want to just see Tanya, you can certainly put your um, Zoom onto speaker view. Um, and if you notice, Tanya um, has in her name her phone number and her email, so if you'd like to contact her, that certainly is available. Um, so Tanya, we are so happy to have you with us today. Can't thank you enough for being here. And with that, I'd like to turn the program over to you. Thank you. I really don't have anything to say. Um, it's a little, uh, I do feel nervous. So I'll start with that um, and apologize in advance if my dog or my cats disturb us. Um, as Miranda said, I'm here to talk about the topic that most people want to avoid, and, and that's uh, funeral services and end of life. And, you know, we as human beings are avoidant of pain, and sometimes the mere thought of death can be very painful for people. And so, of course, talking about funerals can be painful too. Um, and often as parents, we don't speak about, to our children about what our needs are or our desires for our funerals. Um, and as children, we don't wanna think about our, our parents passing either. So it's a topic that is often avoided. Um, I often use my own personal experiences, um, not just in funeral service, you know, growing up in a funeral family the topic of death is uh, dinner table conversation, which uh, is a little strange for most people. Um, I talk about my mother and her passing and how much comfort that we had as a family knowing what her wishes were for her funeral service. She told us the readings that she wanted read in church and the hymns what she wanted to wear, who her pallbearers would be. And when her death did finally um, come after a long and difficult illness, you know, as her children sitting in church, you know, hearing the words that she chose for us to hear that day um, was extremely comforting. And, you know, we knew that we did everything that she wanted. And and that's an important thing for people. I hear it all the time with families who have pre-planned of um, how much comfort it gave them to know that they followed through with exactly what their parent or spouse or loved one wanted. And on the opposite side, it's um, you know people who are find themselves with a loss unexpectedly when the topic was never discussed it's often very painful for them to make the decisions. Um, you know, there are people that never express whether or not they want to be cremated or buried. Wow. Um, and that's a big decision for, for someone else to make for a person. So um, when it's made in advance and communicated to someone, 
uh, that really brings a lot of comfort to the people who are left to make those final decisions. Um, it's funny because here I'm a funeral director and uh, in a funeral family um, and my, my late husband who passed very unexpectedly in November of 2019 um, refused to make funeral arrangements even with his wife. <laughs> um, and I used to say to him, I'm going to, you know, something's going to happen to you. And I don't even have a cemetery plot. Like I, I'm preaching to people all the time, how important it is to be prepared. And here I'm going to be grieving and having to do this job, just like people I say, <laughs> try to teach. Um, but he didn't want to do it. I think it was, um, sometimes people have this thought that if they make the plan or purchase a grave or think about death, it's like they're sealing the deal and now it's going to happen because they've got the plot. Um, but it was tough. It was tough being in that circumstance with my five children and an unexpected loss to have to then find a plot um, and be my own funeral director in essence. Um, and then it's also kind of funny with, in reference to my husband now, that, uh, you know, he wouldn't make these plans, but in my early part of my career, we had this casket at the funeral home. It was called the Senator and it was beautiful and I loved it. And so one day I came home from work and I said, oh, I picked your casket today. You're going in the Senator. And it became a joke between the two of us because I said it often enough, you're going in the senator. Sometimes it was funny and other times it wasn't, it was a little more serious ordering the senator. Um, and that was years ago. And then when he passed, uh, I'm thinking about, oh my gosh, how am I going to be with the kids and choose a casket and do all of this? And and then it dawned on me, I have to see if the senator is still available. And so that is the casket that we used for him. And it was, it, it sounds so strange to say it, but it really did bring me comfort knowing that that was really what he was going to be in. Um, so I, I guess I, here I preach to people about making decisions and talking to their children about their desires and then didn't wasn't prepared myself. Um, you know, people often have questions about uh, cremation, which seems to be more and more popular and whether or not you can have services prior to a cremation. Uh, often people think that if they're gonna be cremated that, you know, there's nothing beforehand, that it's just the cremation. Um, and you can actually have a full wake and traditional service. And then rather than going on to the cemetery, the cremation takes place. In our area, um, we do have a section of Worcester Cemetery that is for green burials, which is another new topic. People want to want to be green and uh, protect our environment. Um, and so there is a section in Worcester Cemetery that's completely green. Uh, no chemical intervention for preservation would take place. Uh, any casket or wrap that's used for the burial is directly into the ground with no outer container. And anything um, that's used is completely green with no chemicals, it's biodegradable. Um, for that section. And I believe they also don't allow like machinery into that area to dig the grave. It's done um, by hand. And I believe the family can also do that. I'm not quite as well versed with that because uh, it's not something we do very often. I ac actually have not yet had a green burial, um, but look forward to having that experience. Um, Oftentimes, as people age or face illness, they will call the funeral home to come in and make pre-arrangements and pre-planning where they meet with the funeral director and we get all of their vital statistics 
which are used for a death certificate and go through the funeral planning process where they make their selections. Um, and the purpose of this is to really get them an accurate estimate of the costs. Some families choose to put funds aside um, that are either, some funeral homes use insurance products where they sell like a life insurance for the total amount of the funeral. Others like myself, we use a trust company where the funds are put into trust and invested and gained in, gain interest. Um, that is often a very um, comforting process for the survivors because it's already in writing at the funeral home and the funds are put aside for that purpose only. Um, you know, often families don't have access to their loved one's monies because the accounts get frozen when someone passes, the bank will freeze their bank account. So where you may have been using power of attorney to access those funds prior to their death, now you can't. Um, and so by having uh, the, the money set aside that eliminate some of the stress and worry of the family of how are we going to handle these initial expenses uh, before the estate process finishes. Uh, we're very fortunate in the state of Connecticut because funeral homes are very heavily regu regulated by the state and the Federal Trade Commission. Um, I'm sure everybody's heard horror stories about other parts of the country where funeral directors falsified death certificates and absconded with monies. Um, Connecticut is really very tight with those things. So um, having the fear of putting money away, you're, you have a little less to worry about here in Connecticut. Um, and also, you know, you can set something up with one funeral home. And then if you were to move to another area or another part of the state or another state, you know, you're not obligated to the funeral home that you originally made arrangements with. You can transfer those funds to whomever you would be using. Sometimes this is a little more lively when people ask questions. So if anyone has a question, you're welcome to ask away. You're muted, Robert. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, what is, and I know it could go, it could range considerably, but what would you say is the average cost? If you had to throw out a number for, for a funeral. So it's kind of a wide range because it, it very much depends upon what is selected, number one. You know, you can have a very reasonably priced casket that's $15.95, or you could choose a $5,000 casket. Um, so that's a very big variable. That's like a low end and maybe a, maybe, well, I'll say a high end, but maybe a low end. What's a low end to, to so make sure? I, I, there is one other variable that I'd just like to mention, and that's the cemetery. Um, you know, St. Peter's Cemetery right now for a double depth opening fee, that's where one goes on top of the other, is $2,900. Whereas Worcester Cemetery is $1,500 roughly. So that is a huge leap from one to the other. Um, I would say if you're looking for a more economical and you have a reasonably priced cemetery, you would be at, at least 10. Um, and I'm thinking also like, you know, with a viewing and taking someone into church yeah. okay. is going to be higher. Um, the other option is doing things at the funeral home and then you don't have some of the outside expenses. So on the low end would be doing everything at the funeral home and going to the cemetery. Yeah. On the higher end, I could be 14 to 16,000. Um, and that's, you know, a little more going into church and a fuller service. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, you always think like, you know, 
you're not you're not expected you're not planning for but even children you know you have children you know you're gonna if something was unexpected that happened to them you know you're gonna take care of it absolutely and it's, what kind of thing should i have in place because that would be certainly a to add to the experience you're going through to suddenly be facing 20,000. So it really is good either to have them as a rider on your policy or really probably to keep their young enough, get them policies to take right. one thing to take care of. Absolutely. And then they have it the rest of their life too. Yeah. Even if you're paying a premium, you know, just to, at least for a time, you know, to, to cover it because that would be a very big hit if something unlikely as it may be, but, but to happen. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, you know, again, even myself being unprepared, uh, you know, looking at the outside expenses that would have to be paid um, immediately can be thousands. And yeah. so, you know, some funeral homes will work with an insurance policy where um, they work with an outside service that in essence gives a loan on the policy immediately so that all those initial expenses can be covered. Otherwise, most insurance companies take at least three to six weeks to process the insurance. So you have to have something to kind of bridge you in between. Yeah, I mean, even, even knowing that you're getting it back is, would be a, you know, from a policy would be a big, a big Absolutely. help. Absolutely, absolutely. Outlay it up front in some way. Right. Well, but if, if you couldn't outlay it up front, then you're right, you'd have to plan for that. And it's difficult nowadays because we're so transient. You know, uh, yes, I was born and raised in Danbury. I've lived in the same five mile radius for my entire 48 years. But most people, I'm, I'm abnormal nowadays. So mm -hmm. to buy a family plot somewhere and assume that, you know, you and all of your children are gonna be in the same cemetery yeah. eventually, yeah. you know, you really can't plan that way because, you know, your right. kids could live in Alabama. Yeah, yeah. yeah, thank Laura. you. I have a question. Can you hear me? Oh, Priscilla? Yeah. Can, oh, okay. can you hear me? Hi. Hi. I don't know if you can answer this or not, but I'll ask it and just see what happens. Uh, my parents, my father had pre uh, purchased three burial plots one for himself and for my mother's. And they're both occupied, um, but the third one is still available. And they had purchased the third plot to bury their foster daughter in case of her demise. Well, she did pass away, but her family chose to cremate her and keep her ashes. So what do I do with the third plot? Can you just so, keep it? I, I guess, you know, you... It's a tough question to answer because yeah. Yeah. I would hate to tell someone to um, sell a plot back to the cemetery and then find themselves in need mm -hmm. because the cost yeah. of space has gone up so dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I would think very long and hard about yourself and your family members and, and what your plans are. Uh, you know, even with cremation, some people choose to still bury in the cemetery. So, you know, at some point in the future, you may want to be there with your partner or a child or whomever. Um, most cemeteries will allow at least two sets of cremated remains in a full size grave. Oh, yeah. um, the other option is to approach the cemetery. They will uh, purchase space back, however, the unfair side of that is that they will purchase it back for the amount of money that it was purchased for. <laughs> so, oh. you know, if it was bought 25 years ago, you may only get $400 for a grave that today is, you know, 2,500. Right. Okay. Is it a local cemetery? Um, Beaver, Beaverdale in New Haven. Okay. Right. I'm not familiar with that. Line. Yeah. Sometimes you can sell them privately as well. I know Worcester has like a list of people who are looking to sell their spaces. Okay. Um, I don't know if that cemetery would have one as well. Uh, okay. That's something I think I would approach the, my siblings about, but um, I don't, I guess I don't want to lose it because I think I, I agree with what you say. You never know. So maybe we should just hold on to it. 
Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. I think Maura had a question. Yeah, thanks. Um, my mother, I'm here because of my mom, she's 87, but as I go through, through things, uh, with her, I'm really thinking ahead for myself now. And I'm wondering, I have six grown children and I'm wondering how you recommend I start to talk with them about my wishes about aging and death. Should I bring it up individually, casually with each one? Or should I have a meeting and talk with all of them at the same time? Or should I just write down my wishes and, and just leave it for them so they'll have it all in one place and they don't have to think about it until then? So I think if you called a meeting and had your six children there and said, now I want to talk about my funeral services, you're going to scare the daylights out of them and they're going to think something's wrong with you. <laughs> so it's a gentle topic. Um, I think that, you know, you need to make sure that they don't then have to feel fear because that's going to stir up those and grief. I think you know, you grieve a little bit every time you even think about your loved one passing. Um, I think you're in a situation where you can have this conversation with them fairly naturally. Um, you know, at the age of 87, as a, your mother's caregiver, you're starting to think about her passing. And so having them experience and talk about decisions that are going to be made with her, open the door to have a very natural conversation about what your needs and what your wants are. And I find too, if, if people ask a question, you know, what do you think to their children? Do you, you know, would you want to be cremated or buried? Because then it takes a little bit of their fear of losing you away. Um, if you're interested, there's, um, the National Funeral Directors Association has a program called the Talk of a Lifetime. And it just gives a lot of guidance about how to talk about funeral service with your children. And also the importance of sharing other parts of your life with them that you may not talk about and talking about when you were a child and your first experiences and you know, things that molded you into who you are today, things that we don't necessarily always talk to our children about. Um, and I know it sounds like it's a little off, but knowing those things about your life before them is part of the process of, you know, leaving your legacy and them sharing in your life before they were part of it. Okay. I don't know if I answered your question. Um, thanks. Well, you did clarify that it's probably better to talk with them each individually than suddenly as a group. And then maybe I could also write things down. So when they're having all kinds of feelings, it'll be there for them to look at. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Thank you. That opens a topic too. I, I often do presentations similar to this, but um, my focus is more on what we can leave behind for the people that we love. Um, and writing things down is, is good when you're making your funeral decisions, but also writing to them and leaving them a message that they can hold on to forever. My mother was diagnosed with cancer 13 years before she passed. And her cancer journey was really um, a journey into herself and learning about herself. And while she did that, she was constantly writing and she discovered she was a poet and would write poetry and she'd write letters to us. After her death, we found journals all over the place and little scratches of paper with things she would write down. Um, and it was so comforting to us later to have the things that she wrote and the messages she left for us. Um, and sometimes it was just like a Bible quote that she liked and what she thought it meant or, 
you know, a poem she read, she would rip it out and make notes on it and, and journals. And it's, it's really been a gift for all of us to have those things to remember her with. So don't just write down your funeral plans. So I, I, this is Lynn. I have um, another take on that conversation uh, more. I, I actually would have responded all of the above um, to how to have the conversation um, only because of what I see in, in the hospital where at some <clears throat> times and it's so difficult at the end and people don't know what to do or different children have different ideas. And if they all hear the same thing, that can be more helpful. Um, there's the conversation project that you can access online, which has wonderful information about how to bring up the topic in a very natural way. Uh, I think T Tanya's pointed that out. It's not something we talk about at the kitchen table. And uh, the conversation project actually is, that's their focus, trying to make discussions about death and our own personal wishes um, something very normal to occur in a very natural way. So you might find that helpful. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to just clarify. I wasn't saying don't talk to your children about death. I was just saying, if you call this meeting out of the blue, the six of you come meet me and then wanna talk about your funeral plans, it, I would give them a little heads up in advance. Um, I wasn't saying don't talk about it. I was just saying, you know, you might want to be a little gentle on the entry because the big sit down <laughs> that's can what be took scary. Yeah, I understood. Thank yeah, you. I, and I think that's the great thing about the, the conversation project because it really, it offers specific ways to break the ice because it is so hard. Tanya, if I may just add something, I'm a rabbi, I deal with this all the time. Uh, if you don't do everything before the funeral, chaos will ensue. And I've seen families, the one thing in life that they didn't discuss was the death of their parents. And uh, it throws the family into chaos. And I think the more that you can spell out, <clears throat> the more you can talk about death, it's gonna happen with all of us. Uh, the better it is, you're really giving a gift to your children when you are able to talk about things that are very difficult to talk about. No one likes to talk about it, but it's amazing. You do it once and it's done. So my advice is please, please do the talk. The, um, the woman just suggested the conversation about death, which is online. There are great sites, but I really believe that if you don't do it to your children, for your children, you're doing a terrible disservice. Their lives will be thrown into chaos when death comes. Death, I, I think that death happens to all of us. I mean, everybody knows we're going to die. And when my parents died, uh, I went, their cemetery was halfway between visiting my aunts and I would take my children and stop at the cemetery halfway to rest. And we'd have lunch in the cemetery. And a lot of people I spoke to said, you're taking, you're having, eating lunch in the cemetery. I said, yes, it's a very peaceful place and it's very quiet and it's nice shade and you can have a nice little picnic lunch. And I can visit the graves of my parents and they can visit their grandparents. So if you take opportunities to speak about death, it becomes more of a normal uh, occurrence, which it is normal because mm -hmm. everybody's going to die. And Mary, did you yes. have something? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Tanya. I said, everything that you have said has been so on point. And I agree with, um, uh, the Honorable Rabbi and stuff, my mother um, had everything done, everything prepaid, and there was eight of us. So it was very nice. Some of the details, I sat with her at the um, New Year's Eve before she died, 
and we actually planned out her funeral mass, you know, being Catholic. And that was, and she died um, February 10th. So we had everything in place. So uh, with all due respect, it was, it was wonderful. And she, she had already gone to the funeral home, picked up everything and had the insurance. I wanted to get back to the uh, finances, if I may. Now, can you, uh, if we meet with you, and is there, um, so you would give money to this trust, say, um, just for conversation purposes, say we put $5,000 into this trust. Now that would go um, and then be invested, and then hopefully it would grow until enough. Now, can you add to that trust periodically? So in the state of Connecticut, um, the, the laws are very specific. And, and when we sit with someone to do prearrangement, regardless of what their financial circumstance may be at that time, we want to plan for the event that they needed to receive Medicaid benefits from the state of Connecticut. So often, you know, people at end of life are in nursing home care, which we know can be very costly and they spend their assets quickly and then need um, assistance from the state of Connecticut. So one of the things we're very conscientious of is keeping things compliant with the Medicaid laws in the, in the state. So as of right now, the state of Connecticut Medicaid guideline is that you can have an irrevocable funeral trust with a total of $10,000. They just really re increased that to 10,000. Um, and that money gets invested. So we work with interment trust services, which is the trust company that is endorsed by the Connecticut Funeral Directors Association. So they're a good reputable company um, with a long tradition in doing this for funeral service. Those monies go into a pooled investment. Your principal is guaranteed. So therefore you're not gonna lose money in a stock market and then you only have 3000 left. Um, they grow nicely, I would say between two and 4%, depending on what the economy is. Um, definitely better than a savings account. Um, and so one, again, one of the challenges we have as in doing these estimates is, you know, you, you want to plan and have the perfect amount of money set aside. Um, because if at the time of one's death, they are receiving Medicaid benefits, then any monies left in the trust have to get sent back to the state of Connecticut. So they allow the $10,000 irrevocable. As we said, I said earlier, you know, the average funeral is between 10 and 15,000. So the additional monies can then, for some reason, the state won't let us put it all into the one irrevocable they will allow us to do a revocable burial plot contract for the difference. And again, any monies that are in there can be used for the services and they're not considered an asset against you if you need Medicaid benefits. Okay, but I have a question. So you have to put 10,000 or you can start the trust fund say with 5,000 and right. then go up to 10. Yeah, you can start the trust with any amount of money you'd like. Um, we usually suggest a minimum of a thousand, um, but I believe that's just our suggestion uh, and we can do it with less. And then you know, you can either add to it or not add to it. Some that's people send us a check every month that we deposit for them. Others might send something once a year or after income tax come back or they they have their own rhythm of, of sending in deposits. Okay. A That's nursing home can also That's be directed. Um, you know, people are allowed to retain a certain amount of money for their personal needs in the nursing home. So they have their patient account. So the nursing homes can also be directed to send 
you know, $25 a month to the funeral home for the trust. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And that that's, I just mentioned, that's how we do it at our funeral home. Other funeral homes work either through trust or insurance products. And I believe you can do the insurance products one of two ways. You can either do, you know, the whole check at once, you know, the whole 10,000 or whatever, and do the insurance policy, or you can make monthly payments like a regular life insurance. I, I will mention one other thing because some of the Medicaid laws are up to the interpretation of the social worker who's reading them, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and often as people are being guided through that process with their parents and in, in nursing care, um, if you have a life insurance policy that has cash value to it, the cash value in a policy is counted as an asset. So some social workers will tell the families that they have to cash in the policy and then use the cash to uh, fund a funeral. Um, it's unfortunate be, that they don't all realize that what can be done to save that policy is the funeral home can actually write the trust paperwork as they would for a cash account being opened. And rather than the families putting the funds aside, they can fund the trust through a beneficiary change on the life insurance. That's not something you should just go ahead and do. Please don't just automatically change it. You have to go talk to the funeral director and do it the right way. <laughs> I've had a couple of families recently that we did a kind of a question and answer. They called with questions and talked about this beneficiary change. And then they said, oh, by the way, I changed it to the to you guys. And I'm like, no, can't do it like that. <laughs> we have to do it legal. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi, Tanya. Hi, um, I just, hi, I just wanted to make a comment on the um, conversations with uh, children and your parents um, as someone who's done done both. Um, I used five wishes with my parents, um, and not only is it discussing funeral arrangements, but it's also discussing um, how aggressive um, my parents wanted to be at the end of life. So um, we were able to have those conversations. And then I did the conversation project with my children um, last year. So they were 19 and 23, and um, I had to do it for, for a school assignment. Um, but, and they were a little bit taken back by having that conversation, but it really opened the door to normalize the topic of death. Um, and it was, um, it was a good conversation that I had with both of my children. And they, they do know my wishes and it's also written down. So um, yeah, I think it takes, off, it takes some of the, um, the stress at the end, um, especially not only the funeral, but your wishes if you were to become ill and incapacitated, what you'd want done. Absolutely. That's all. Absolutely. Advanced directives and living wills. Um, I see the direct benefits of the survivors when they don't feel like they're the ones that made the decision to stop life support. It's, it's really comforting when people have that in place and takes that burden from your loved one's shoulders. Oh, now we have a low. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> um, so as I said before, people often have questions about cremation. That's a, a good topic nowadays. Um, and, and having services prior, if someone wishes to have um, a, a traditional service, they're welcome to. Um, you know, I think often when people do talk about their services, I hear many people say, you know, just cremate me. I don't want anybody looking at me. I don't need a wake. I don't want everybody coming and staring at me. Nobody should see me. And I understand that feeling. And, you know, we walk a fine line when we're making funeral arrangements with people to 
maintain first and foremost the wishes of the person who's passed and also to help guide the survivors um, to a place where they find healing and peace with the decisions that are made. And I often sit with people and say, well, you know, do you need to see your loved one? And they say, no, she didn't want to wake. Okay, I understand we won't be having a wake, but, you know, do you have a need to see her? And they often struggle with that because they take that no one needs to see me. I don't want anybody looking at me very seriously. Um, and I think it's important to make sure that you, if you feel that way, that you let your children know that if for their grieving process, they need that, then of course you would want them to do what they need to heal. Um, many funeral homes, Again, I can't speak for everyone other than, you know, what we typically do, but most, I believe, allow families who are having cremation to have what we would call an ID viewing, um, which doesn't require that the person be embalmed typically. Uh, we would just have some quiet time with the person um, available. We usually use a dressing table. Um, we don't require the purchase of a casket for that and the person is bathed and dressed and, and the family's allowed to come in and spend, you know, a short amount of time. It's not a tremendous amount, maybe 20 minutes or a half an hour, just to have that opportunity to say goodbye. That's been particularly an important piece during COVID because so many people haven't been able to be present with their loved ones as they're passing. Um, so I think it's, if, even if you don't want to wake, it's, it's good to be clear with your children that if they have a need to see you, that they're, they're able to do that. Yes, Maura. You're muted. Okay. Um, can you please tell us some of the decision, the decisions that have to be made? Like uh, you mentioned Paul Bearer's hymns, outfits. What are some other things, decisions that have to be made? So, um, you know, again, sometimes the type of service is going to dictate what needs to be decided upon. Um, so I often start with, you know, the first major decision is, has the person chosen to be cremated or buried? If it's burial that they choose, oh, I'm sorry, Gracie's. <laughs> She's been so good until just now. Um, if they've chosen to be buried, then, you know, where would they like to be buried? Do they have a family plot or do they have a specific place that they would like to go? Um, if they're being, being cremated, then, you know, what would they like you to do with the cremated remains? Some families, a family member is going to keep them. Some may choose to scatter somewhere. Um, others want to be buried in the family plot with another loved one or be buried eventually. Um, so those are all kind of the decisions within decisions on cremation or burial. Um, and then I, the next question that we look to have answered sooner rather than later is whether or not they wanted to have a viewing. And again, that's a public viewing with someone who's been embalmed and prepared for that purpose or a viewing where it's just your loved ones where embalming may not be necessary. Okay, thanks. And then the church service and all the details that have to do with that. Depending on what your faith is and, and what your desires are, you know, some it's to go to church and have um, a Catholic or a Protestant service, um, or if you're of the Jewish faith, they have their own traditions. Um, each, each faith has their own traditions. So um, decisions within that arena are very specific to what the faith base is. Um, and then sometimes there's also a gathering at the burial plot afterward. So often if there's a burial, the family will attend the graveside service, which follows your funeral service. Okay. 
And then some families leave us to go on to have a luncheon or gathering where, um, you know, they can, it can be more of a celebration atmosphere than the somberness of, of the cemetery. Okay, thank you. Although some cemeteries are joyful services too and celebrations. Um, and then if someone wants an obituary in the paper, uh, that's often, you know, some don't want anything in the paper, others choose to write their own <laughs> and, and leave it for their loved ones or want specific things mentioned. My mother has made a lot of these decisions already, um, like cremation, um, she went, I went with her to talk with the funeral director. Um, she has answered some of these questions for me and she has some things written down, but I just would like to, you know, like to el eliminate the element of surprise as much as possible. Thank of you. Of course, you're yeah. welcome. Tanya, do you, on that note, do you have like a, a worksheet in a sense that you use? I'm, I'm sure you're gonna ask the family a series of questions. Do you make something like that available? That would be even, helpful for those that want to prepare now? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, I was trying to, um, I do have something. I, I have a, a booklet that we as a funeral home made. Um, I was trying to see if I could edit it so that it wasn't so commercial. <laughs> so um, I didn't want to appear to be just promoting my own funeral home. So uh, uh, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. I can provide you with the booklet. Um, I didn't have it in a document format that wasn't branded. So, yeah, that's fine. I mean, you, this is your presentation, so you could you can promote your. I understand. If you would like a copy, I'll be happy to get you one or send it to you. Um, I might have be able to do it digitally as well. You have my contact information under my name. Yeah, yeah, we can reach out to you if you'd like to get one sure. for, for those that are in the church to Absolutely. help guide them in there or even for your own personal use. Yeah, that would yes. be great. I'll reach out to you several. Okay, good. Thank you. Hey, Tanya. Hi, Liz. Um, this is so informative. Um, and, you know, I like how you're covering, you know, so much of these details that if you've never planned a funeral, you wouldn't know. Um, and I really appreciated Mara's question, which were the really small details, because until you're in those shoes, you don't necessarily think about that. Right. But there's one other little piece that I feel like we haven't covered and working at the hospital, I've, I've heard people ask this, which is the family member dies and then it's like, then what? Yeah. And so like, how do they get from point A being at the hospital till eventually getting to the funeral home and getting those plans? Like nobody kind of knows that in between place sure. and it can be very unnerving for Absolutely. families. I would guide the family to call the funeral home. Okay. Um, the hospital in particular does not call the funeral home. So you may tell the nurse on the floor, please call Cornell Funeral Home. And they, in good faith, say the hospital will, will reach out to the funeral home because they don't all realize that they don't. <laughs> so it's not uncommon for us to get a call hours later from a family saying, you know, is my mom there? And it's hard to then tell them, you're the first to notify us. Um, so the first call would be to the funeral home and then the funeral home takes it from there, regardless of where the person has passed. Um, we coordinate through the hospital or the nursing homes for the transfer of care from the, of the person to the funeral home. Um, there are times in some areas in some hospitals, you know, like other parts of Connecticut where the hospital will need verbal permission or something signed for the body to be released. Um, that's not the case in our immediate area. They will allow us to go and pick someone up in good faith. Um, and, and, then, and most of the nursing homes will ask what funeral home, they will call us. 
the nursing home facilities will call us uh, and we coordinate with them. But it's always good to hear from the family as well, no matter what, because that the sooner they make contact with us, the sooner their feelings are put at ease that someone with a name is going to take care of their loved one. Tanya, I also think it's a good idea to make contact with your clergy, yes, whether absolutely. it be a priest, a minister, or a rabbi. I've had situations where uh, if it's a prominent person, I know that I have to clear my calendar absolutely. a certain number of days because I have to do this funeral. And uh, sometimes we're the last ones to find out. And uh, it's always a good idea. I mean, none of us know the exact moment of death, but it, it's good to contact the clergyman well before and let us know the status of your loved one. Because then yeah. we can make some kind of plans too. And I tell you, having to put together a, a eulogy in five minutes is a terrible pressure. And I know in my own case, if I can have a little bit of warning, I can be of help to people. Yeah. But those last minute calls are just so unnerving for those of us who are clergy. I would like to echo that too, as a pastor in uh, Connecticut, um, to be able to support the family is huge. And, and to know means that we can then support, but also the question Maura asked about questions to ask your loved one now, if there are particular uh, scriptures or religious readings that are important, uh, particular prayers that are meaningful, those are incredibly helpful to those of us who are seeking to serve in that moment, to draw on the things that are meaningful from your loved one uh, into any graveside or religious service. Um, so I would echo uh, what the rabbi has said on this, that as clergy, it's extremely helpful for us to be able to serve you and your family. One question that I had, Tanya, just to add to this is, is there a standard um, cost with funeral homes or is there a, an expectation when when you say that a loved one needs to contact the funeral home is this a matter of having to call several to get an idea of pricing or is there a standardization in connecticut so i would say there's no well i it's going to vary from one area of connecticut to another um you know fairfield county even within fairfield county there's a huge variable you know the danbury area is going to be a little bit less than stamford and greenwich um so you know it's going to vary from what part of connecticut someone's in um and there are other low cost options of funeral homes and cremation services where like there's there's a lot of competition in the cremation arena um, most full service funeral homes provide a direct cremation without services. And then there's these other services that that's all that they do. And they're a lower cost option because of the fact that they typically don't maintain a building necessary for public services. So they can just do cremations only. So there's a very wide range of cost there. Um, as well as um, in funeral services in general. In the Danbury area, I would say, you know, most of us are within a reasonable amount of each other. We're all kind of in the same ballpark. Um, and it's tough too for people who call to get a price, an idea on price, because one funeral home may charge more in the arena of their service charges and then their caskets are more expensive and vice versa. You might pay more on one side and then the caskets are less expensive. So, um, in, and like when people get a cost estimate from me, I'm gonna give them a very complete cost, not just my charges, not just the merchandise. I'm gonna mention that the Danbury News is $500 and, you know, a casket spray of flowers for the top of the casket is probably going to be about 250 to 350. You know, I bring in those expenses outside of myself because that's part of the total. If I say $12,000 and that's it, and I'm not thinking about all those other things, then I'm not serving them with a good, accurate estimate.
Tanya. Yes. Um, if you have a relative that has moved out of state and they're going to have a funeral up there, wherever they live, and you want to have a funeral back where they came from and grew up, do you guys do that type of thing? Like, so you would have dual funeral More homes? More than one service. One, so yeah. that does happen fairly frequently. Again, because people may spend the end part of their life in one area, they want to have uh, closure for the people who love them there. And then their cemetery is here or the rest of their life was spent here. Um, so often people do come back and have a second wake, um, usually obviously without the body present in both places. Um, sometimes it's cremated remains or a memorial where there's no body or cremated remains just to give the people local an opportunity to have their closure. So yes. So you, you basically could rent or use the services of your funeral home even so, though there's nobody, the person's in a different place. Right. If you so will. usually, and again, I can't speak to how everyone does that. Um, you know, it's hard to, because people are paying funeral services in one state and then to then have similar costs in a second location is hard. Um, so it, it can be a little costly for what is being done if you're just having a wake. Um, but as a funeral home, we have to reserve our building for that time for you. So then we can't serve someone else at that same time. So there has to be a cost to that. Um, I try really hard to be as reasonable as I can um, and work with people on that and not charge the full service charges. Thank you. You're welcome. And Tanya, I see a question in the chat um, from Bernadette. Um, do you provide a live stream funeral service? My family member's funeral was live streamed and son in Middle East was unable to go home for the service. And with COVID, three of the children were out of state and not mm -hmm. able to attend. It was a very big help for the whole family to be there via live stream. So yeah. COVID has put a completely different spin on, on how to make funeral services inclusive. It really um, has. So I don't know, I know we're, we're kind of out of time, but I don't know if you just wanna speak for a couple minutes about sure. that. And with things starting to open up, I don't know if you have any um, thoughts or advice as to how to proceed as we're moving through the pandemic. Sure. So I'll, I'll toss that to you. Um, yes, we've been uh, live streaming um, from the funeral home for wakes and funerals. Um, of course, cell service gets a little challenging when you're at another location. Um, so the, do, we do the best we can to have the live stream. There are times when we have to video portions of the service and then upload them later. Um, we've been, my son actually, who's here in the chat with me too, Alfredo is my son and a, a student in funeral service. He's been my technical uh, guru at the funeral home to get our live stream up and running. So we actually put it at the end of the obituary on our website so that it's not too difficult for people to access. And then if there's parts like the graveside where we didn't have cell service, it's recorded and added to the video later. Um, you know, I never really thought that I'd do live streams, <laughs> but I am so grateful for it through the pandemic because people need it. And whether it's distance that separates you from your loved ones or the mere fact that the funeral homes are limited as to the number of people we're allowed to have in the building. Um, you know, even as things are opening up, people are allowed to have 50% of their capacity. Well, my building's capacity may be 150 people, but the chapel is just one room. So my capacity of the chapel is much less. Um, so we're still really limiting our services to 20 to 25 people, which if you have a larger family, 
that's not going to do it. And there's some funeral homes who are not doing any in person in the funeral home services right now. Um, I recently some funeral homes have been doing what's called like a walk through wake, um, which is really just that you're very strongly trying to encourage people not to gather in the funeral home and basically form a line where they can pass the casket and exit the building. It's difficult though, because people want, you know, we need that physical reassurance and comfort of someone hugging us. And so you see someone you love, it's, you know, you're not gonna, our little barriers that we put up aren't gonna keep you from hugging them. <laughs> Um, so yes, the live stream has been very beneficial. And sometimes we don't live stream. Sometimes I offer, offer the family a Zoom like this. I like the Zoom for a wake because then the family can interact with the people who are there. And that's been that's been good. Anya, you might want to know there's a company in Illinois because I just did a funeral there, Weinstein Mortuary that uh, professionally shoots every funeral they do and it comes complete with a lectern and a cameraman who is yeah. there but as a result of it now I, I say it uh, almost jokingly but it's not it enabled uh, at a very cold freezing funeral in illinois a few weeks ago it enabled 305 people to wow. see the funeral online i mean on uh, whatever it's called zoom yeah. but it uh, it can be a tremendous help and sometimes you can even access the funeral afterwards if you're not able to attend the funeral. There's a lot to be said about Zoom. It's not all bad. I mean, we all want to embrace each other and be there. And I miss that with all my heart. But there is something about the Zoom service that is has its own power. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. And as I said in the past, it seemed... Um, it seemed cold to me, but I'm so grateful to have it to offer people now. And, and I think it does have its advantages. And once COVID is over, I think we'll probably still continue because families are so separated by distance. Yeah, I mean, you think of a, a national figure who passes like a president or something, and, uh, you know, which is impactful for people. And then, but it's it's on TV. You're able right. to be part of that. And uh, but yeah, the closeness certainly for family members, but the streaming it out for anybody else who's a, who's away or whatever the case may be, who could see it later, still feel like they're a part of it, mm -hmm. even though they weren't able to be part of it when it actually occurred. Right. Yeah. Well, Tanya, you know, thank, I know we've just about run out of time. So I just want to say thank you so much. You know, oh, you, you're welcome. You, I, I feel strongly that you offered a compassionate and informative talk today. And I'm really thank glad you. that so many, so many of those who were here felt comfortable asking questions and diving a little bit deeper into some of these topics that we don't always have the opportunity to talk about or that can be hard to talk about. Yes. Um, very true. So I, I thank you. Do you have anything that you wanted to say to, um, to everyone to end it or? Well, I guess I'd just like to reinforce that, um, you know, I really do enjoy helping to educate people and anyone who is here that has questions, you are more than welcome to reach out to me, regardless of if I'm your family funeral home or not. Um, I, I, it's really not about that you need to come to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm here to answer questions regardless of, of what your future plans are. Oh, thank you. That's very generous and, and very, very kind. My um, pleasure. So thank you. Thank you for being here. And thank you all for being here. Really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Miranda. Great hostess. Thank you. Good job.